Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 160. Yes, the zombie apocalypse ending. We are at post-disciplinarity. The first three vlogs in this series explored interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity. They're complementary ways of thinking. They're complementary lenses to see and interpret and understand reality. They are strategies, they're methods, they're ways of thinking that help us understand reality in its diversity and complexity, yes, but they're also strategies to gather information and to transform that information into knowledge. Brilliant, fantastic, accountable, transparent, wonderful. Post-disciplinarity is just a little bit different. Post-disciplinarity is meta, it's volatile, it's unstable, it's unpopular, it's radical. It gets in people's faces. It is really knowledge at the end of the world and knowledge for the end of the world. So it really is zombie time. This is radical praxis, right? Summoning profound institutional change and institutional transformation. So it's really unravelling and unsettling our very notion of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. It is unpopular knowledge and yes it is defiant knowledge. It gets in people's faces and it critiques really pretty savagely the way in which our universities, our institutions of knowledge are organised. There are costs to your career if you commit to post-disciplinarity. So that's the important caveat and indeed warning as we go into the gig this week. And let me just give you two examples to show where that maxim comes from, that post-disciplinarity could and probably will hurt your career. So I just come back uh, to Australia from the United Kingdom, I think about six years ago, and I was speaking with one of the heads of the ARC. And he stated very matter-of-factly on one of his PowerPoint slides, people tend to bring PowerPoint slides to meetings with me, uncertain why, but on one of his PowerPoint slides, he demonstrated with a really, really big data set that the wider the field of research codes, so the more dispersed the field of research codes in a grant application, the less likely that grant was to be funded. So for our colleagues both inside and outside of Australia, field of research codes are part of the Australian research system. So what the field of research codes do is they log and lock in a particular slice of knowledge. So in Australia you have a two digit code which is a bit big but then it hammers down to a four digit code and indeed even more narrowly a six digit code. So what that means is related fields have ad a close to each other in terms of field of research codes. So if your field of research code is dispersed, so that means colleagues are doing some pretty heavy lifting, there's one field of research code and there's another way over there, so colleagues are really doing some heavy lifting and research, that research won't get funded. So what we learn from this is the ARC, the most important organisation for knowledge and knowledge dissemination and development in this country, does not value that type of radical interdisciplinary work. They don't fund it. It's not a value. Okay, so let's cut to my second story. I'm at a meeting uh, sitting next to a research leader waiting for the meeting to start and he's describing his mentoring to a young male academic. So the young guy came up to him and said, look, I'm writing a transdisciplinary grant for the ARC. The older scholar paused and then said, don't bother. And that was the end of the mentoring session. And what I found so odd is when uh, this gentleman was telling this story, there was a group of colleagues around him and they all laughed at the conclusion of that story. So what do we learn from these conversations? What's going on here? Well, we learn that disciplinary knowledge is respected and it's funded. Movement 
risk, challenge, critique, moving outside and critiquing the very boundaries of knowledge, working at the edges, smashing the boundaries, that is not valued and it's not funded. So what's happening here? What is happening here? Well, post-disciplinarity can explain it to us. So let's do this. So all disciplines have gatekeepers. These are senior people who gain power from maintaining the boundaries of disciplines. So they maintain their power and the power of the discipline. Now they do this by only publishing it and valuing particular journals, by having in those journals articles that use particular language, particular methods, particular vocabulary, particular theories, and those boundaries are patrolled through refereeing. So editorial boards and also conference boards, conference committees are stacked with these like-minded people who understand implicitly and explicitly the boundaries of the discipline and they patrol it. So grant structures and funding are then based on these established parameters of what is going on within a discipline. So research evaluation is built on and based on the maintenance of these parameters. Now these strategies work to keep powerful academics powerful and those established disciplines, you've guessed it, established. Those who don't fit rarely get published, rarely get grants, rarely get keynotes at conferences, rarely get promoted and are shunned from awards and acknowledgements throughout their career. So the consequences to knowledge from this particular mode of organisation is really stark. The gatekeepers maintain the boundaries of their discipline. And of course, it also happens to accidentally, not really, maintain their personal power. Yeah. So before we move to the scale of the critique, and I launch the full zombie apocalypse post-disciplinarity critique of this, I want to just talk about the word post in relation to the word disciplinarity, so the word post. Now, when we use the word post, whether it is in postmodernism or post-colonialism or post-structuralism or indeed post-disciplinarity, it is not suggesting that the term that follows it is over. Now, I understand where that argument comes from, you know, the post, it's in the past, because in the Latin, of course, particularly post did mean after. But particularly since 19, the 1960s and 1960s theorisation, it's actually connoted really the exact opposite. The post suggests a reflexive engagement with the term that follows. So what it does is it opens up the space between the words. So post-colonialism, post-modernism, and yes, post disciplinarity in the space in between those words volatility liminality agitation interesting stuff happens so the post is a powerful space it's a theoretical space it's a revisioning space it's liminal and it is unstable so what often attends a post-disciplinary area, so you probably know you're in a post-disciplinary area, is the word studies. So there'll be a word and then it's followed by studies. So when you see that, something something studies, it's either interdisciplinary or post-disciplinary. You have to work out which one. Now the reason that's related and those two particular tropes are related, interdisciplinarity and post-disciplinarity, is most frequently post-disciplinarity emerges from those interdisciplinary forms that were created in the 1960s. So the argument is all these interdisciplinary fields that were created in the 1960s, man, are now stable, have their own gatekeepers, their own journals, their own conferences, and yes, you've guessed it, their own field of research codes. So the interdisciplinary interventions have gained the solid boundaries of a discipline. So how ironic is this? So that's where the post-disciplinary critique is really, really aggressive. And what happens is the post-disciplinarity emerges and grasps on the top of those interdisciplinary fields and goes hard. So let me give you an example that I know relatively personally. 
Cultural studies in Australia is an absolute mess. It is inward, it is boring, it is disengaged from context, it's got this weird fixation on texts and critical discourse analysis like it's 1984. It's lost its backbone, it's lost its energy, it's lost its passion. So it's got no deep engagement with the brutality of the political economy after the global financial crisis. As you can tell, I'm not pulling my punches in the vlog this week. But the gatekeepers have never been more aggressive in celebrating the great men and women of cultural studies from the 1960s and the 1970s and maybe just the 1980s. So the interlopers in this once passionate interdisciplinary area, cultural studies, have gone full zombie apocalypse. They've gone full post-disciplinarity. So now we have physical cultural studies. We now have popular cultural studies, the return of the Jedi mode. So really, really interesting pop popular cultural studies at the moment. And of course, a little area that I had some involvement in, uh, Trump studies. So scholars have moved out of cultural studies to offer the tough commentary on it, so the post-disciplinary critique. So yes, post-disciplinarity can also operate within a paradigm as well. So you know, sometimes you just leave and you just attack it, but sometimes in very interesting interdisciplinary or disciplinary areas, the post-disciplinary critique is managed within it, and leisure studies is a great example of that. Leisure studies was a profoundly important interdisciplinary paradigm, but through the 2000s, it became increasingly tired. But renewal came from within. Younger scholars were able to use feminism, was able, were able to use post-disciplinarity, and able to use digitization to critique and shake up what was leisure studies. They also have, of course, their post-disciplinary arms, so the colleagues who have left leisure studies to offer a critique of it. So we see that through particularly digital leisure studies and also deviant leisure. So as you can see, the post-disciplinarity can come from within the discipline or can leave it and offer a commentary from outside. So I'll give you some other examples of these post disciplinary areas and you can see sort of what we're dealing with extreme anthropology ultra realist criminology brexit criminology so much of this post disciplinary critique emerges through theoretical interventions now this is the important bit so the key area of post-disciplinarity is there is a devotion to or an understanding or a work with a particular theorist so when you're looking at theory and theorists, disciplines don't matter at all. They don't matter at all. And that's when we start to see Baudrillard studies, Zizek studies, Badieu studies, Althusser studies. And of course, we now have in these post-disciplinary initiatives, open access journals that follow the theorists. So the International Journal of Baudrillard studies, the International Journal of Zizek studies. Now importantly, this is open knowledge. This is platinum open access, these journals, and that means nobody pays anything, authors or an audience, platinum open access. So there is that meta critique of the commercialization of research as well. This is high theory, theory without apology. This is hard stuff. This is tough stuff. This is not dumbing down. This is working absolutely at the cusp of where we can work. Now, what is significant is that this really powerful, edgy, hard post-disciplinary work is not emerging from the Ivy League, the Russell Group, or the Group of Eight. Traditional universities are wedded to traditional disciplines and they gain funding and they gain respect through that engagement with the traditional disciplines. So they are rewarded by traditional measures of evaluations of research. So why would you change if you're in a discipline, you're doing well, you're being validated for that commitment, right? But there are scholars and institutions that are doing things a little bit differently. And let me give you some examples. So deviant leisure emerged from Plymouth University in the United Kingdom 
ultra-realist criminology came from Teesside and it's now moved to Northumbria. Extreme anthropology came from Oslo. Physical cultural studies came from, and still does come from, Waikato, Bath, Bournemouth and Maryland. Sports humanities came from Waseda and post-digital studies, how brilliant is that, post-digital studies comes from Coventry University. So this is not safe or centred knowledge. This really is knowledge from the edges. It's not only highly theoretical, but it is post-empirical. Remember post? Post-empirical. So therefore its relationship to science and scientific methods is ambivalent at best. So you're probably a little bit uncomfortable by this vlog and that's good, that's what I'm trying to do today. Post-disciplinarity is not meant to make you as a scholar feel happy or satisfied or have a sense that you know what's going on. Post-disciplinarity is meant to make you feel a bit uncomfortable, a bit frightened, a bit threatened or what is going on, a bit edgy, that's the point of it. I should also say that post-disciplinarity is controversial. This term, compared to the other three, in the, the three earlier vlogs, doesn't have the credibility, doesn't have the currency of the other three terms. Interdisciplinarity now is taken for granted. It exists on grant forms, right? So yes, I do interdisciplinary biology. Remember the field of research codes? I do interdisciplinary biology. You tick a box on a form, yep. Transdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity similarly have strong traction in methodological discussions in the traditional sciences but also in health. The reason being that multidisciplinary crew come together and very efficiently, very quickly provide an outcome, particularly for government. Yeah? So it's efficient and it is productive, therefore validated. But post-disciplinarity is like the wild child sitting on the naughty step. It's pretty hard to handle. It's willful in its dissent and critique. So there are two trends that we're seeing in post-disciplinarity. So it is important when you hear that word, you try and work out which of these two approaches is being deployed. The first way of using post-disciplinarity is the recognition that a discipline requires new spaces. So someone just gently leaves the discipline and offers a reflection on the boundary of that discipline and how it could move. So it's a reflection on the discipline, post-disciplinarity. But there is another way in which it is used and it's much more radical. This argument is we need the disciplines to disappear in order to create space for intellectual freedom, for creativity, so this is an epistemological rupture. This is an organisational rupture, because remember universities are configured around departments, faculties, schools, colleges, they're organised, yeah? So these organisational units frame insiders and outsiders, who belongs and who doesn't. And that's why I find the term post-disciplinarity so productive and useful. Because it is an epistemological view. It is a lens. It's a lens that allows us to ponder the disciplinary organisation of knowledge. And isn't that powerful? Now, Marin in 2007, oh wow, I remember the first time I read this, in 2007, created an incredibly evocative image, stating that all disciplines are positioned between the abyss and metamorphosis. Wow. So in other words, all disciplines contain their own seeds of destruction and disintegration. So they will just simply die, probably of boredom. So every discipline either has the seed of death in it or the seed of renewal. And the option comes in and through the role of post-disciplinarity. All disciplines have something within them that might just create that renewal, that capacity to transform. So I see now so many of the formerly really edgy interdisciplinary paradigms and studies, like cultural studies, they've just jumped into the abyss because they do not want to change. So for example, our book, Trump Studies, took on 
the brittle nature of cultural studies. We went hard, we went real hard. And we argued that cultural studies was fixed, it was tight, it was backward looking, and suggested that Trump's studies, as a post-disciplinary paradigm, could provide that bridge to the metamorphosis. Needless to say, the gatekeepers in cultural studies weren't hugely impressed by this. And while the book has sold incredibly well internationally, for which I'm incredibly grateful, uh, in Australia, it's generally been greeted with silence. Isn't that a surprise? Okay, but the nature of disintermediated publishing and social media is that the gatekeeper's capacity right now to block or restrict the movement of knowledge is tougher than it's ever been. And this is the really exciting bit of the vlog, I think, because post-disciplinarity thrives through what I've called the three Ds throughout these vlogs. So digitization, disintermediation, and deterritorialization. So in the analog age, disciplinary barriers and boundaries were much easier to maintain. You had a print journal, you went to a conference, and those alternative voices could be silenced. You would never read them. But now there's lots of ways you can find an audience. If one journal blocks you, there are thousands of others. And podcasts, videos, tweets, blogs, get new knowledge out so it will find an audience. So yes, post-disciplinarity is the term to watch. And journals have offered a series of special issues. Actually, it's a good sign if the journal of a discipline has a post-disciplinary issue, because it suggests they're aware they need a bit of movement. And there is a fantastic biennial conference uh, on post-disciplinary approaches that's been held so far in Switzerland, in Germany, and in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And significantly, they frame their project. Their maxim is, knowledge is disobedient. Magnificent. But post-disciplinarity, as you can imagine, is pretty unpopular for those men and women in power. Surprise, surprise, not. And I always remember Gergen said in uh, 2009, quote, if innovative scholarship comes from hybridity or impurity or the blurring, then the boundaries are disciplining. The boundaries are the enemy. There is no thinking outside the box without risking banishment from the box. I'm going to say that again because this is the warning for you. There is no thinking outside the box without risking banishment from the box. End of quote. So early in your career, and I'm mainly talking to wonderful PhD students out there, but early in your career, and maybe your whole career, depending on the discipline, you're going to have to play the research academic game in the box. That's how you're going to be successful. And that may be your decision, and you will be rewarded in your career by nesting and nestling in that box. And warning, you have to decide if you have the courage to leave the box knowing that if you do, you may not be able to return. So post-disciplinarity gives us as researchers a position to reimagine, to rethink, to revision knowledge, to revision how we organize reality, truth, and our understanding of the world. Disciplinarity suggests that researchers cluster in an organized, an ordered way on topics that are rendered legitimate and important by the men and women in power. And research evaluation and review exercises like the RAE, the REF in the United Kingdom, the ERA in Australia, whenever basically you have a field of research code placed on you, and of course all of our PhD students, your research is in a field of research code, that's an act of disciplinarity. That is an act of disciplinarity. It's a top-down controlling act. It's a conservative act. It's an insular act. And it reinforces the status quo of our research. But why does it happen? Well, you as a researcher gain from this system. If your research is nicely nested in conventional systems, conventional structures of your discipline, then you will be supported to do your research.
So therefore, why would some of the most brilliant, extraordinary, imaginative and innovative scholars on this planet decide to walk away from those support structures? Why would they hamper their own career through post-disciplinarity? Because it's not in their best interests. Well, let me provide perhaps a context for post-disciplinarity. There is an argument offered by scholars such as Frederick Darbelle that all our disciplines, frankly, are in ruins. They're inward, they're insular, they're implicated in the power structures that we were meant to be critiquing. So if we are to solve the social, intellectual, political and economic problems of our time, then we have to build on the ruins build on the decaying disciplines and do something different. Now obviously you know, my life has been basically built on the post-disciplinary project. I've committed my life to that, to the revisioning of the university. That is my project, that is my life's work. And obviously my late wonderful husband, Professor Steve Redhead, he was one of the proponents of this. So his career was based on smashing the disciplines, as he used to describe it. And of course, this was embodied in what was his last book published while he was alive, Theoretical Times. And how powerful that this book, Theoretical Times, written by a dying man, is talking about our dying disciplines. Really important. So this book has basically become the New Testament of post-disciplinarity. It provides the theoretical foundations for a lot of this work, aligned with what many disciplines are referring to now as claustropolitanism. So the argument Steve has made, which has been quite well accepted in claustropolitan sociology and ultra-realist criminology, hi guys, is that we now live in post-empirical times. Remember the use of post there post-empirical times. The disciplines are exhausted and the interesting work is now emerging in theory. So that's why we have journals like Baudrillard Studies, Zizek Studies and so forth because theory cannot be locked into a discipline. Theory is wild. Theory is provocative. Theory is promiscuous. It moves about and it can be an incredibly radical force in intellectual life. It's hard, it's tough, it's confronting, it's difficult. Now, you can absolutely disagree with this post-disciplinary project and I absolutely understand that and it's probably in your interests to disagree with it as a project, as a trope, as an agenda, as a goal. But I'd wanted you to at least hear the arguments to think about your positioning in terms of research. And I wanted to finish the vlog in this special little series with a statement from Edwin Marin from that pivotal year and that year of pivot, 2001. And he stated, quote, our compartmentalized, piecemeal, disjointed learning is deeply, drastically inadequate to grasp the realities and the problems which are ever more global, transnational, multidimensional and planetary." End of quote. So post-disciplinarity is unpopular knowledge. It is the rat bag of our university. It pokes and pokes through the fabric of knowledge. Post-disciplinarity will not get you a grant. Uh, it will not get you published in the best journals. It will not get you promoted but it is committed to something. Something beyond the next meal, something beyond the next citation, something beyond the next promotion. It asks all of us as scholars who we are. And, and what do we stand for? What do we stand for? This series, I think, has offered you some tropes to think through the different projects and the different ways we can address and create knowledge. So interdisciplinarity is powerful, important through the integration. Transdisciplinarity is great because of its rigorous understanding of the movement of ideas. And multidisciplinarity builds collaboration and consensus. How amazing. All valuable, all incredibly important. Please use them. But perhaps there will be a moment in your career where the conventional, the predictable, 
the consensual, the integrationist is going to hold you back. You may fit in. You may be really successful, and I hope you are. But there may be a moment in your life where you reflect on what you've lost by fitting in. What you've lost by maintaining the traditional roles. Those of us who are post-disciplinary dance outside the established disciplinary boundaries. We go outside of traditional methods and approaches. We critique and question what are traditional methods and approaches. And when we dance outside of that box, it has its own movement and its own energy and it creates new space. It offers incredible courage, I think, to summon intellectual, social, cultural and political change within a university, to live and to research differently and defiantly. John Savage once said, quote, history is made by those who say no, end of quote. And there may be a moment in your career where that negation, that no, transforms you and transforms research. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.